Well, good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here, and I'm glad you're here. I want to acknowledge the Carrier Nation and the Sequoia Nation for allowing me to come to their ancestral lands in this capacity to let them know that I come as a friend and a neighbor and a relative and an ally. You know, it is those simple protocols between our nations that go back 807 generations. And it is out of the deepest respect for those tribes that I acknowledge them. My name is Mike Ritaskit, and I come from the Bonaparte Indian Band of the Shushwap Nation. It's good to be here. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sunrise Wind the Salmon Com. My board name is Cheryl Chapman, and I'm from the Hot Seat First Nation in Soda Creek Indian Band. And it is good to be here with you this morning. And we'll get more information later about who I am and how that works. So I've asked uh, Mike or Sinja here to uh, lead a hand drum song to start the morning off. All right, is it okay with you guys if we share a hand drum song with you? Is that okay? All right. I want to talk about the song we're going to share. I composed the music. And in order for that to happen, I went out onto the land for four days and four nights without any food or water and sat in the wilderness in ceremony. I took time to talk to the loon and to talk to the coyote and to ask them permission to be able to compose these songs for the people. And when I came off of the mountain, this is one of the songs that I brought with me. And it is a coyote song, a song for the people. Lay away. You know, it's a, it's a way to bring us together and to make us all feel welcome uh, together. And I hope that uh, the song, you know, uh, lifted up your spirits a little bit and, and energized you for today and the important work that you got to do today and, and anything else that will help make the day go a lot better. That's, that's the intent of that song for the people today. Thank you so much for allowing us to share that. Good morning. So I'm 
I'm hoping that uh, you've noticed the picture behind me to my right, and uh, I'll share the story. So my character is Lucy Charlie, and I was born in 1867 in Teethkit, which is Lillooet or mile zero on the Gold Rush Trail. And uh, I was raised to be a domestic, you know, cooking and cleaning and doing laundry and tending gardens, all the good things that a good woman should know how to do. And uh, in my 18th year, I was uh, there in Teethkit and James and William Sellers and Mr. Moffat were on their way back to the gold fields and they stopped in Lillooet and they were looking to hire a domestic. Now, I think my mom probably didn't think it was a good idea for me to leave with three strange white men. So she insisted that they hire my older brother, Charlie Charlie. Now, Charlie Charlie was a blacksmith. And so James and William and Mr. Moffat kind of got a two for one uh, deal there. They got a uh, blacksmith as well as a domestic. And we made our way north on the Gold Rush Trail to 164 Mile House. 164 Mile House is also known as Deep Creek House. And it's like a modern day bed and breakfast. So there I worked at Deep Creek House, cooking and cleaning and doing the laundry and tending the gardens. And my brother set up his blacksmith shop across the road. So we worked there at Deep Creek House, but we also worked up at Soda Creek. Now, Soda Creek is where the stern wheelers make their way up the Fraser River from Soda Creek to Quinnell Mouth and on to Fort George. And the town site of Soda Creek is on the north side of the creek. And then the creek comes down the mountain there and it runs over Alpha Rock. So it bubbles. That's why it's called Soda Creek. And on the south side of the creek is the Hatsith First Nation or the Soda Creek Indian Band. And Hatsith is uh, Sokwetan or Shushwap word for on the cliff. And the community there is Shushwap. The people there called me Thinokia, she who works where the water flows, because I used to do the miners' laundry there in the, in the soda water, which is really good for cleaning. So there at Soda Creek, I met my partner, William Sellers, and he was the illegitimate son of James Sellers and Sitkatsa. And Sitkatsa is registered as Indian woman Chushwap type. That's all it says about her. So William and I got together and we had seven children that survived. And the picture here is myself, my daughter Agnes, daughter Alice, Alice's husband, Chief Joe Paul from Alexandria, which is Estela, the carrier community just south of Pernamo and youngest son, Alfred. Now, all of my children went to the Indian Residential School, St. Joseph's Mission. The mission was established in 1867 as an industrial boarding school. And then in 1886, it was transferred to a um, contract between the federal government and the Roman Catholic Church as an Indian Residential School. And so all of my children had to go to the school between September and June. But by the time they were about five years old till they were usually about 15 years old, it was against the law for them not to be at school. So when my youngest son, Alfred, went to the residential school and he showed up at home in, at seven years old in October, uh, it was quite concerning to me. Not only because my seven-year-old had walked for two and a half days by himself from the Indian Residential School back to Deep Creek House, but also because the authorities, I thought the authorities would be coming after him and I could even be arrested for him not being in school. However, Alfred produced from his pocket a note which stated that Alfred is a savage and unteachable and you should just keep him at home. And it was signed by the priest. So I kept Alfred at home with me and we worked at Deep Creek House, but we also worked at Soda Creek. And while we were at Soda Creek, he would play with the non-Indian kids across the creek in the town site. And I think that he became kind of a distraction to the children. And the teacher got a little frustrated with him and dragged him into the school at Soda Creek and was able to teach him to read and write and do arithmetic. Now, in today's society, Alfred would be uh, classified as dyslexic. So it wasn't that he was unteachable. He learned differently than other children. So he did manage to learn to read and write. 
And of course, he worked with me. And in the picture here, Alfred is about 10 years old. And by this time, he was already driving a four horse hitch. So our family delivered goods from the stern wheel stop as well as from Deep Creek um, out to Barkerville, Richfield, out to Lakely, Horsefly, Quinnell Forks, and even down to St. Joseph's Mission. On one of Alfred's trips down to St. Joseph's Mission when he was about 19 years old, uh, the priest came out to help him unload the wagon. And uh, the priest was talking to him and said, by the way, Alfred, how come you don't have a wife? And Alfred said, well, I'm too busy. I'm helping mom with the roadhouse, Uncle Charlie with the blacksmith shop. I'm delivering goods all over the territory. I don't have time for a wife. And the priest said, nonsense, Alfred. And he went back into the residential school and he came out with Adele Clara Bob. Now, Adele Clara Bob was born in, on May 17, 1909 in a small Shishwap village that was located right where the Williams Lake Stampede Grounds currently are. And uh, unfortunately, Adele, later known as Addie, was orphaned when she was two years old. Her mom was killed in a horse training accident. And uh, Addie was raised by her aunties for a couple of years until she was old enough to go to the Indian Residential School. And then she was transferred to the Residential School and made a ward of the church. So the priest had total authority over Adele's life and gave her to Alfred, married them on the spot, and sent her home to Deep Creek House with Alfred. Now, I don't know if they ever really fell in love or anything, but they had 15 children. Now, they would have had 17, but Addie lost two. And then they adopted three children, and uh, their eldest son, Albert, and his wife, Alice, had 11 children, and shortly after the 11th child was born, Alice passed away, so Addie and Alfred helped to raise their children as well. Now, you probably lost count, that's 29 children, and recognizing, of course, that not all of them were at the house at the same time, the little littles were home, and then the middle ones, of course, from 5 to 15 were at the residential school, and then the older ones, as they came home, either worked locally or they went out to work at other ranches in different places. But um, they did have a large family. And then, um, so historically, our communities were very well balanced. Everybody in the community had a job. And from the littlest little to the eldest elder, and if you were really good at hunting, everybody followed you. You know, and if ever you were really good at basket making, you would teach everyone else how to do it. If you were great at berry picking, people would follow you to go to the berry patches. It wasn't one person dictating what everybody did. Everybody had a job, and if they were really good at it, they became the mentor for the next generation. And the elders would watch the children. And if they navigated more towards basket making, they, the person that did the basket making would become their mentor. And their little mentee would follow them around and then they would eventually take over that lead role. So we each had jobs and everything was really well balanced and everybody was honored for their skills. And they were encouraged to do the things that they loved to do and that they were really good at. So it was a really good and balanced community. And then the British government came along and decided that we were lawless and we didn't have a governance structure and that we needed a what the European terminology is, chief, to tell us exactly what to do and how to do it, of course. And so they sent the Indian agents into the, Indi the Indigenous communities and appointed chiefs in every one of the communities. So at Hatsuth or Soda Creek, they appointed Alfred as chief because he could read and write so that he could communicate with the governments. There were a couple of challenges with that in that our community didn't operate that way. And then the second challenge is that Alfred was the youngest son. So if you can imagine the king coming along and appointing his youngest as heir to the throne, there would be a little bit of chaos in the family. So Alfred did the best he could under the circumstances. When he would hunt or fish and he was successful, he would share with the rest of the community. When the government would send their uh, food stamps, he would go to the local store and he would fill his saddlebags with dry goods. And he would ride from house to house 
and deliver a little bit to each house to make sure they share throughout the community. Um, while collecting information about what the community members required or needed from the governance people. So he did the best he could. I usually shift here, but if I shift, I'll be out of picture. So I'm just going to do this. Hello. I'm Sunrise When the Salmon Come. My borrowed name is Cheryl Chapman, and I'm from the Hatsu's First Nation, Soda Creek Indian Band. My mom is Jeanette Lucy Sellers. Oh, my grandfather is Alfred James Sellers. And my great grandmother is Lucy Charlie Sellers. This is my family. And I'd like to welcome you all to our traditional territory that we share with the Diné or the Dakal. And uh, the community that was originally here was at Bear Lake. And Bear Lake, um, their community was Shishwap and Carrier or Mix. And uh, at Contact, there were approximately 2,000 people there. And then after the smallpox epidemic went through in 1862-63, the community was reduced to two people. And those people went into, of course, survival mode and, and had to figure out how to survive. So the community there is now an archaeology site. And it was renamed in 1916 to Bower and Lake, Dr. John Bower and the first gold commissioner. So I welcome you to our traditional territory and it's good to have you here with us. Thank you very much for joining me. I'm going to turn it around. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mike Ritaskit, and I come from the Bonaparte Indian Band of the Shushwak Nation. I'm really happy to be able to come here today uh, and join Autism BC to share a few stories about the culture and the history of our people. And I'm going to start out with this piece right here. <laughs> And I'm going to bring it up closer to the screen. This is a this is an arrowhead, and um, it is it is made from igneous rock. Now, igneous rock is uh, made from heat, made from fire, kind of like lava. But this isn't lava. This type of rock is known as basalt. And where I come from, the Bonaparte Indian Band, there is a huge quarry of basalt. Oh, it's the size of a mountain. That's how much of it is, there is there. And the Indian people actually valued this way more than we valued gold because we utilized it to make our tools for sustenance, like this arrowhead. And now, if you notice on this piece here, it has what archeologists would call a fluted edge. And because of that, archeologists would categorize this piece to be a Clovis point. Clovis was an era of time dating back anywhere from 10,000 to 13,500 years old. So here is a piece of direct evidence that demonstrate the length of time that Indian people have occupied the land. Here is another piece here, and it is also basalt. It's an arrowhead as well. And this piece would be more like five to 8,000 years old, as archeologists would say, toward the end of the Paleolithic period. And I had to Google that part of it. And if you notice the difference in size between the two pieces as well, back in this time period, animals were bigger. So I thought that was very interesting. You know, and throughout this entire period of time, the Indian people have always maintained a very close connection to Mother Earth. 
to the plants and to the trees, to the water as well. And I, I want to talk about the water for a second. You know, water gives life to everything in our entire existence. Without water, nothing would survive. And everything that water does for us, it quenches our thirst, cleanses our bodies, provides us with food, prepares our food, provides us with recreation, provides us with transportation, and this day and age provides us with energy. It gives life to everything. And water can also take our life away. So it's just a matter of finding balance and having respect when we are in and around water. And I'm not sure if you ever thought about water like this, but water communicates to you. Have you ever been by the ocean or by a lake and you could hear the waves crashing against the shore? Have you heard that sound? There it is. When you hear that sound, the water is communicating to you. How about down by a creek or a stream and you could hear the water trickling downstream? Have you heard that sound? There it is again. The water is communicating to you if you take the time and you listen to that. How about, have you been out in the forest and you could hear the wind blowing through the trees? Have you heard that sound? There it is again. This time, the trees are communicating to you. And what's happening when you hear those sounds of the waves or the trickle of water or the wind through the trees, it's sharing a song with you. And more often than not, the song that is being shared is very healing. So I want to encourage each and every one of you sometime along your path or along your journey to just stop and listen to that. Nature really does communicate to you. I want to share another example about um, a spider who was communicating to an old Indian man. The spider was teaching an old Indian man. One day, there was an old Indian man, and he was down by the river. And there was lots of salmon swimming by. It sure made the old Indian man happy to see that many salmon returning. And he stood there all day and he watched. And then evening started to settle in and the old Indian man began to get hungry. So the old Indian man was gonna go down to the river to catch a salmon for supper. So the old Indian man goes down to the river and he's scooping into the water. And every time that he grabbed on to a salmon, it slipped right through his hands and got away. And it was hilarious because the old Indian man was soaking wet from head to foot. Well, the old Indian man never did catch a salmon that day but he wound up going to sleep by the river that night. And then the next morning, when the old Indian man woke up, the salmon were still swimming by. But the old Indian man became very interested in a spider and the spider was weaving a web. And then the sun began to shine down onto the spider web where the old Indian man could clearly see the web. But through the web, the old Indian man could see salmon swimming by. 
and it gave him an idea. And his idea was to go get some twigs and some bark and some branches and to begin to weave a web, something kind of like the spider's web. And when he was done, he took his web down to the water and he scooped it in and he pulled the salmon out for supper. So that was a story about a spider teaching an old Indian man how to catch a fish to sustain himself and his family. And it is stories like that that have been passed down from generation to generation. And in time, those stories become what today we call our traditional ecological knowledge. So I'm really happy to share that with you. <coughs> shall we share another song? Uh, yeah. Sure. Or shall I share some more stories? And um, some first. Okay. Okay, we're gonna share another song. Is that all right with you guys? All right. Thumbs up. <laughs> Again, this is another um, coyote song that I wrote out on the land. Oh, ho, ho, ho. There was one question that came in from Anthony, uh, who first thanked you for sharing some stories and your time with us today. He's very appreciative of that. Uh, he's curious to know if it's true that North America was, is called or referred to as Turtle Island. Uh, and if so, what does Turtle Island mean to you? So um, I'm trying to remember the story about Turtle Island and how um, it originated. And there, there were two turtles. And um, there was no land and they needed land. And so one turtle told the other turtle, you go down to the very bottom of the ocean, and pick up a handful of sand and bring it up to me. And so he did. And he placed the sand into the turtle sand. And he says, you do that again. And he kept on doing that all day long. So then the next day, the other turtle went down and grabbed some sand and brought it up. Pretty soon they were getting lots more sand 
and there was more and more sand and more and more sand. And they did that every day, and that's how Turtle Island was created. <laughs> and that's why they call it Turtle Island. If you um, take a map of, of the continent and you look at it, it's actually shaped like a turtle with the arms and legs and the, and the head. If you take a map and look at it, and I understood, sorry to go against you a little bit here, <laughs> but I understood that the one turtle sacrificed itself and the other put the sand on the back of the turtle until it built up the land mass and big enough for the creator to place its North American people and mm -hmm. creatures here. So that was my understanding. Mm -hmm. So a little bit different there, <laughs> which you'll find um, in a lot of communities. There's slight variations on creation stories and on um, the history that we've been sh that has been shared with us over the generations. We always find that we're all connected to each other, and we're all connected to Mother Earth and that creation of of what we call Turtle Island. It's that creation story is about the turtle and how uh, North America was actually built. It all connects back to the turtles. So it's interesting to see the slight variation from what he was taught and what I was taught. Neat, big question. Neat, thank you. Can you talk about the goal? If there are other questions, if people feel comfortable, you can unmute to ask questions in the bottom left-hand side, um, and, or you can type them into the chat box and we can read them. Uh, we did get another question that came through here uh, that says, why are they called coyote songs? I really like the question. Um, you know, in the Shushwap Nation, if there were clans of people somewhere through time, it was kind of lost or kind of the teachings were kind of about clans were forgotten about. Um, of course, on Coast Salish territory, they do have whale clans and wolf clans and turtle clans and mm -hmm. things, frog, frog clans. But in the interior, it, it, it was either lost or it never, there never were. And um, the reason that I call them coyote songs, coyote songs, is um, because I remember grandma and grandpa, you know, they never did tell me I was um, um, originated from coyote stories and coyote teachings. But I just remember them sitting around the table and talking about the trickster coyote. And so later on in life, long after they left Mother Earth, um, I just kind of pieced it together and go, I, I must be, uh, I must be um, a descendant from the coyote because this, the teachings that they passed down to me. Nobody, yeah. nobody told me that. But, and because you're a trickster, and, yeah, I know why. <laughs> so in our area, you know, from our community with Hatsuth and in our surrounding areas, our connection is more to the bear, the black bear, and we consider them our relatives. We don't eat bear, we don't hunt and eat bear. We, when we see them, we honor them and, and thank them for their presence in our in our lives. And, and we we are very mindful of the bear. The bear taught us. How to survive in this area in this part of the, the region because of the extreme winters you know they teach us to make sure that we gather all of the supplies and they get that we gather everything we need in order to we don't necessarily hibernate all winter but we do go underground um, we live in pit houses or ski skins and uh, we go into our winter homes and there we're comfortable and warm and we're gathered as a family and we you know, um, create our, our very utilitarian artwork, which is baskets and mats and, and the things that we need to, you know, our, our vests and our jackets and our moccasins for the next year so that we have everything we need 
to um, come out of our winter um, hibernation basically and be ready for the next season of hunting and gathering and, and doing the things that we need to do in order to survive. Because in our territory, it's, it can be pretty extreme. So the bear is, is our brother and sister and we, we, we follow their teachings here in our area. So that's a, it's always a connection to Mother Earth. If you watch the animals, they teach you things. They may be just teaching you how to dance like a crow does. But the, the crow also has a really long memory. They're, they pay attention and they, they remember things. They even remember people's faces. So if you're ever mean to a crow or a crow's family, and you go back to that location, it'll dive bomb you. You know, like they talk about it in Vancouver, the, the crows that go after people. And because those people either yelled at them or somebody that looked like them threw rocks at them or something or were a threat to their family and they'll they'll go back after them it's really interesting to watch those simple things where where uh, nature you know and the animals communicate but also you know teach us things to be good to each other i don't know how much time we have you're at 1137. Pardon? It's 1140. All right. All right. So do we have time for another story? Yes, we do. We do have time for another story. All right. So I'm going to share a story about the gold. In 1860, there were a group of Indian men from Eskedem. Today, we know them to be the Alkali Lake Indian Band. And they're located about an hour west of Williams Lake. One day, this group of Indian men were walking along the hillside near the Chilcotin River, about where the Chilcotin River joins the Fraser River. So they were right at the confluence there. And they looked down at the water's edge. And there was a man down there washing dirt. Now, these Indians had never seen that before. The dirt wasn't even dirty, and he was down there washing it. And so two from the group, a father and son from the Lobbins family from Eskedem, they decided to walk down to the river's edge to find out what this guy was doing. And the river was kind of noisy, so they were able to walk right up to him and they scared him, and he pulled his gun on them. It was Doc Keithley who they approached. But the Indians were quick enough to point up the hill, and Doc Keithley looked up there and seen a bunch more Indians, and he was outnumbered, so he put his gun away. Now, they could only speak the Shuswap language, and Doc Keithley could only speak English. So there was a bit of a language barrier there. But through the dialogue, the elder Lobbins was able to determine that Doc Keithley was looking for Kmetmat, which is Shushwa for gold. Now, the elder Lobbins, he's kind of laughing at Doc Keithley and he's telling his son, in the Shushwap language, he's looking for Khmetmat. And the boy reached into his pocket and he had a big chunk of it. That was his shiny toy. Now he could throw it up against the rock and it would bend and he could pound it back into shape again. And when he found more Khmetmat, he could pound that into his toy, too. Now, Doc Keithley is very interested in the boy. And through the dialogue, the boy was able to let Doc Keithley know, yeah, I, I know where more is. Now, back in those days, during the 1860s, it would be nothing for an Indian boy of 10, or 12 years old 
to walk from here all the way to William site or up to Prince George. Now those cities weren't there at the time, but this whole land was his backyard and playground, especially if he had a couple of these. He could hunt a rabbit or a pheasant or a quail and with, with all of the berries and the water, just be living good on the land. And he could also bring very important information back to the tribe as well. The salmon are running. The wild horses are over here. The moose are here. The deer are down here. That kind of information. So the Lobbins boy let Doc Keithley know three days. And so the father Lobbins and his son and Doc Keithley began to make their way toward Yanks Peak. On their way, the father let his son know, we can't bring him exactly to where the gold is because he'll just shoot us so we don't tell anyone else. And so they get to the base of Yanks Peak right where the draw comes down and they're pointing up the draw. Khmet Mat, Khmet Mat. And then Doc Keithley stepped around the front to have a look up the draw for himself. They were able to escape and get away. And so it was definitely the Indian people that showed the prospectors where the gold was. And then the rush was on. And word spread fast about the gold in the central interior. And people began to converge onto the central interior from as far away as the California gold rush. Those who failed to strike it rich in California began looking elsewhere and many made their way through Oregon and Washington and wound up in the central interior, including this place, which at the time was a wilderness area. There were no roads here, there were no buildings. And once the prospectors began to converge here, the Indian people were forced to make a transition. Right from the onset, the Indian people were displaced from this valley, could no longer go on to the hillsides and gather berries like before, or other plants used for tea and medicine and sources of food, or we could no longer hunt in this valley because we would be accused of looking for gold. And so we were displaced. And then the gold claims came. And what the gold claims did to the Indian people, it dispossessed the Indians from the land. And what the displacement and the dispossession did to the Indian people, it made them dependent, dependent on the federal government. And that was 159 years ago. And even today, we still find ourselves in that situation of dependency because on the land, there is still an outstanding question that we all know as Aboriginal tenant. And I really raise my hands to the people of Barkerville for allowing me to share the story up to the point of Aboriginal title to help provide our guests with a different understanding of why we are where we are today. Thank you so much. There's a lot of thank yous and, and comments coming in and appreciations. And, uh, and we will connect again. Thank you and have a great end of your Sunday. Wonderful. Good stand. Good stand.